You don't know what you're doing. Where you find yourself. Your brother searched the earth to find those books, and you dare destroy them. The earth will be a cleaner place without them. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You're watching PNT. I'm your host, welcoming you to another episode of PNT's Hidden UFO History, our ongoing documentary series where we dig deep into the Project Blue Book archive, hoping to shed light on a remarkable series of events that occurred from the late 1940s through the latter half of the 1950s. While most of us are familiar with the Roswell crash in July of 1947, the actual modern wave of UFO encounters began much earlier, with reports collected from World War II pilots who witnessed small craft they dubbed Foo Fighters performing maneuvers impossible for the propeller-driven craft of the day. Seen by both Axis and Allied pilots, the mysterious craft were but the harbinger of the events to come. Reports were sporadic at first, but with the development and eventual use of the atomic bomb in the beginning of the Cold War, encounters across the globe began to intensify, eventually reaching a peak with the 1952 flyovers of Washington, D.C. After extensive research in the Project Blue Book archives, piecing together the timeline of events from jumbled and often incomplete records, PNT has traced the events of the remarkable summer of 1947. Previously, we covered 17 compelling UFO sightings from June of that year, which were a mere opening act to a July 4th that the residents of Portland, Oregon would never forget, and which provides the next link in a chain of otherworldly visitations that would eventually cause the U.S. military to clamp down an official lid of denial and secrecy on the UFO phenomena that exists to this day. While there were hundreds of reported sightings during that Independence Day, we have selected those that stand out as being both the most remarkable and the most credible. PNT has endeavored to visually recreate the sightings as accurately as possible, using actual footage from the time period where we could, and we hope to capture the essence of each sighting, as seen from the witness's viewpoint. These recreations are solely for documentary purposes and are not presented as real footage, no matter how good we made them look. But for now, relax and let your mind drift as PNT takes you back in time to July 1947. World War II is finally over, and the American economy is experiencing an unparalleled period of growth. The American dream begins to take shape, offering a lifestyle of ease and comfort, but only to the privileged. Racial segregation and discrimination still rule the land, and despite the accomplishments of icons such as baseball legend Jackie Robinson and world heavyweight boxer Joe Lewis, the shiny new communities like Levittown, Pennsylvania still screen their homeowner applications carefully and with prejudice. The use of World War II rationing was finally coming to an end, with ration coupons disappearing and sugar once again appearing in kitchens. Pan Am becomes the first worldwide passenger airline, and the Army Air Force successfully tests the F-80, the first aircraft to exceed 600 miles per hour. In movie theaters, audiences thrilled as Gary Cooper and Paulette Goddard star in the pirate epic Unconquered. The strains of Heartaches by Ted Weems and his orchestra fill the airwaves as families swelter in the grip of a worldwide heat wave, doing their best to escape the sun. People throughout the United States start July 4th looking forward to picnics, parades, and patriotism. Homes are decked out in the red, white, and blue, and happy plans are being made for the evening's festivities. 
But for the people of Portland, Oregon, fate has a different kind of fireworks in mind this year. 11 a.m. near Redmond, Oregon. Teagard resident C.J. Bogna and his family are driving in their sedan on the road from Redmond. They've put the top down in order to catch the last of the cool morning air and are looking forward to the evening celebrations. Passing near Mount Jefferson, they suddenly spot four disc-shaped craft cutting through the air. Shaken and in awe, the family watches as the objects move rapidly across the horizon, utterly silent and flying in tight formations. Following after the objects in their car, the Bognas watch as the UFOs separate, moving randomly over the landscape before finally vanishing into the distance, headed towards Portland. Their sighting was but the first portent of the storm to come. Later that afternoon at 1 o'clock, Officer Kenneth A. McDowell is on duty in State Police Department Precinct No. 1. Taking a momentary break, he steps out of the back of the police station and begins idly feeding the pigeons. The birds suddenly begin to mill about as though disturbed by some unseen force before they abruptly fly away in an apparent panic. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, McDowell begins to step back inside. The hairs on the back of his neck raise as he suddenly feels as though someone were watching him. Turning back towards the lot, he sees five large disks in a tight formation to the west of Portland moving towards him at a high rate of speed. As the craft draw closer to the astonished McDowell, he's startled as two of the craft break formation, moving off towards South Portland as the others continue to fly east over the city. As he watches the craft, McDowell's training finally overcomes his astonishment. Running back inside the station, he frantically contacts radio dispatch and reports the craft, seeking visual confirmation from officers on the east side of Portland. While we can only guess at the ensuing conversation, at 1.05 p.m., police dispatch issued an all-points bulletin requesting all officers and patrol cars be on the lookout for flying objects and immediately report them in. Within moments, of the APB being issued, the flood of reports begins. At 1.05 p.m., Harbor Patrolman K.A. Prim, A.T. Anstead, and K.C. Naff hear the APB come in over the radio and step outside the building, peering up into the afternoon skies by the river. They're astonished as six objects move overhead, swiftly disappearing towards the south. From Prim's report, the disks would sometimes oscillate, and then we would see a full disk, and then a half, and then the things would vanish before reappearing. The things looked more like shiny hubcaps than anything else, catching the sun before they disappeared. At the same time, Washington State Sheriff's deputies John Sullivan, Clarence McKay, and Fred Prides are listening to the dispatches coming out of Portland. Curiosity getting the better of them, the three men move outside and look south towards Portland, less than four miles away. The men suddenly begin to hear a low humming sound, and their jaws drop open as they witness a fleet of 20 to 30 craft moving in formation over Portland. One minute later, at 1.06 p.m., patrolmen Walter Lissy and Robert Ellis, both World War II veterans and civilian pilots, are on patrol in Car 82. Hearing the APB go out over the wire, they pull their patrol car over near the amusement park where the sounds of children at play echo through the air. The laughter turns to puzzlement as the two men exit their car and look up, spying three objects moving at a high rate of speed and high altitude over the area. Parents and children watch alongside the experienced airmen, gaping in amazement as the craft begin to flash intermittently changing course randomly and at right angles, as though they were putting on a show for the astonished audience below. As they frantically scramble for their radio microphone, officers Lissy and Ellis witness the craft move back into formation before speeding off to the south. Lissy and Ellis were not the only police officers to doubt their eyes that afternoon. To the east, patrolman and former Air Corps pilot Earl Patterson 
is sitting in traffic in car 13 at the intersection of Southeast 82nd and Foster Road when he hears the APB. At 1.06 p.m., as he looks upwards past the traffic lights, he spies a silver craft moving at a high rate of speed from west to east. As he watches, in dumbfounded amazement, the craft abruptly turns at a 90-degree angle before moving overhead and vanishing towards the southwest. Whatever they were, they were moving over downtown Portland, and they were all over the city. At 1.07 p.m., Sergeant Claude Cross of the Oregon State Police District 1 is the latest officer on duty to have his lunch interrupted by the APB. Setting down his sandwich and coffee with a sigh, he steps out and scans the horizon. Looking towards the east, he witnesses three disks moving in formation towards the northwest. Cross hears no sound from the craft as they move slowly overhead and vanish from sight. Shaken, Cross becomes the latest witness to call headquarters. Over the next 45 minutes, the reports begin to slow and the harried dispatcher settles back in his chair with a sigh of relief. Looking at the pile of sightings scattered across his desk, he opens his lunchbox and shakes his head, grateful that he can finally eat his fried chicken, and that at last the emergency was over. He couldn't have been more wrong. At 2 o'clock p.m. that afternoon, Mr. E.A. Evans is relaxing in his living room, listening to the radio and reading the newspaper. Suddenly, he catches a gleam of light from outside. He glances out his window and sees nothing out of the ordinary until his jaw drops open in amazement at the sight of three metallic disks flying from west to east over the Willamette River. His forgotten newspaper falls from his hand as the disks pause momentarily over the Ross Island Bridge, hovering in place before moving off again. Suddenly snapping back to reality, he hurries for the phone to call the police as the objects dwindle in the distance. Across town to the south, in front of a neatly painted house, Miss Lawrence J. Hayward is weeding her flower bed, removing bits of crabgrass from among her prized begonias. The smell of a baking cake destined for that evening's dessert mixes with the heady scents of the multicolored flowers. Pausing in her labors, her attention is caught by a flash of light in the sky. Looking up, she is surprised to see a silver disc-shaped craft begin to move slowly over the sandy district. In her later report to the police and Project Blue Book investigators, the startled housewife describes the motions of the object as flipping about like a new dime, wobbling as it moved overhead, pausing from time to time as though it were curious about the homes below. Whether or not Miss Hayward's cake survived the incident is strangely not mentioned in the reports, but throughout the day, the disks continue to crisscross the skies over Oregon and Washington, providing equal measures of fascination and terror to the population below. Later that evening, the mass of sightings finally began to taper off, as though the mysterious visitors were wrapping up their mission and preparing to leave. Perhaps it was this final departure sequence that was witnessed by Mr. Thomas W. Dwyer at 5 o'clock p.m. when he, like many others that day, found his dinner interrupted by the unknown. As he was complimenting his wife on her delicious pot roast with carrots and potatoes, his attention is drawn to the window as he spots two disks flying high over Portland, moving purposefully to the southeast. Quickly dropping his fork and hurrying outside, he calls for his wife to come out to the backyard, hoping that she'll also see the craft. By the time she reaches her husband's side, the craft have already been lost from view, and she convinces her husband finally to come back inside and finish his dinner. While the conversation at the Dwyer's dinner table can only be guessed at, and is certainly not recorded in the reports, it's not very hard to imagine the way it ran. One would like to think that Miss Dwyer gave her husband the benefit of the doubt, but either way, Mr. Dwyer was insistent that they sit outside afterwards, and their patience was rewarded when at 5.30 they witnessed two more saucers moving slowly overhead, pausing over a nearby field before parting and moving off in separate directions as though scanning the city 
one last time before departing. The following day dawned on a Portland in chaos. Hundreds of reports from both police and civilian witnesses had poured in. Officials were unable to explain the sightings and desperately turned to the Army Air Force for help. The military's response was to send Colonel G.R. Dobson of the Oregon National Guard to investigate the events. Rather than interview the official and civilian witnesses or even to read the mass of reports, Dobson chooses instead to inspect the area from the air. With what is soon to become official military policy towards UFOs strongly evident, denial, Colonel Dobson's official report flatly and succinctly states that he found nothing suspicious and sees no need for further investigations of any kind. Dobson goes on to state that he cannot offer any definitive hypothesis as to what the objects are, but being as it was the 4th of July, it is possible that small pieces of aluminum were dropped by a plane as part of the local celebrations. Such pieces would appear to flutter, giving the impression of being a fast-moving disc. Interestingly, even Colonel Dobson appears to have had difficulty swallowing this far too convenient and far too pat explanation, going on to close his report with the above is not to be regarded as a very likely explanation, but only a possibility. One wonders if perhaps Dobson was rankling under the increasing pressure from his superiors to bring the investigation to an end, and ensure officially that flying saucers and little green men had nothing to do with it. Whether or not Colonel Dobson's token resistance was taken into account or even noticed, we may never know. But on the basis of his report, his observations of the area, and his direct recommendation, the case was swiftly closed and buried. As far as the U.S. military was concerned, there had never been anything but fireworks in the skies on July 4th. The residents of Portland, however, were not so certain, with the almost laughable military explanation of these sightings leaving the residents, pilots, and police officers of Oregon and Washington with precious little facts to explain the events or with which to find comfort in the middle of the night. Given the sheer mass of the reports from credible witnesses ranging from civilians to the Portland City Police, the Oregon State Police, Harbor Patrol officers, experienced commercial pilots, and military veterans, there can be no doubt that on the afternoon and evening of July 4th, 1947, something, or someone, came to visit the people of Oregon. What that something was, and the purpose behind it, remains a mystery. But the reports we've covered today are not even the full story of July 4th. From the incredible sighting witnessed by United Airlines pilot Captain E.J. Smith and his crew, to the deserts of New Mexico where an otherworldly object crashed or was shot down by a fearful military near the town of Roswell, our coverage of the events that occurred throughout the month of July 1947 has uncovered a story decades in the making. But what are we to make of these reports? Do we take them at face value? The United States government certainly did. But what were these visitors to our world so interested in? And why? We'll attempt to shed some light on these questions when we return. But first, a word from our sponsor. Energy. How children burn it up, but how they need it. For play, for learning. Energy to keep up with the others. Energy to grow. But what about your child? Is your child tired, run down, underweight? Because she's not getting enough iron and vitamins from her food for rich red blood, for weight and growth? When this happens, it's time to call for Juvenal. Juvenal Vitamin Iron Tonic, the red blood builder that contains iron, B1, plus other important vitamins and minerals, including vitamin B12. And Juvenal tastes like lollipops. So, Mother... Try Juvenal, the rich red blood builder your child may need to get energy from her food. Juvenal to build healthy appetites, to help children gain weight, eat better, feel better. Juvenal is commended by the Council of Parents Magazine 
get Juvenal at your druggists. The big 12-ounce bottle is only $1.98. Welcome back. And remember, make sure to give your children the energy they need with Juvenal. 10 incredible and compelling reports. 10 reports reconstructed from the Project Blue Book archives. 10 accounts out of hundreds reported that unforgettable July 4th in Portland, and each merely a preview of the events that were to shake the residents of the United States of America and the world during the hot summer months to come. But unanswered questions still abound as to the nature of the events themselves. If these experiences were not natural phenomenon, not products of the U.S. military-industrial complex, or a communist plot to sow chaos in America, then what or who were they? Is it possible that an extraterrestrial civilization, spotting the effects of our nuclear weapons, realizing that we had split the atom, came to investigate whether this small planet and its primitive inhabitants was of any interest, and perhaps might have something to offer to the galactic community. Perhaps these visitors have been there all along, monitoring our progress and waiting for the opportunity to reveal themselves openly. Was theirs a mission of peaceful contact met not with trust and goodwill, but instead with the suspicions, hostility, and brutality of the military fresh out of World War II and confronted by forces beyond their control. What happened next, and where did they go? What is the real truth, and where can it be found? Can we only glimpse it through the dusty pages of suppressed government documents, or can we begin to lift our eyes to the stars, and perhaps find it there? Fascinating questions that may only be solved by further exploration of the Project Blue Book case files, and an open mind. Be certain to stay tuned to PNT for more details on this remarkable chain of events in the next episode of Hidden UFO History. And be sure to share your thoughts on the sightings below. That's it for this time, faithful viewers. Be sure to click like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be notified when PNT presents your next portion of the paranormal. I'm your host, reminding you to keep an open mind, because a closed one shuts out the truth. You're weakening, aren't you? Your time is almost cut.